Okay. No, no, Jen, Jen, you need to pull your camera down. I can only see your... Uh... Hi. Hello. Hey, Hi. guys, nice to see you. Wish we could say the same. Except we can't see you. Hey, guys. Hi. I'm in space. Oh, Meg, no one wants to see oh, that. Oh, hey, uh, sorry. Oh. <laughs> How is everybody? Um, is Jen here yet? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, for God's sake. Guys, I'm in San Francisco. Oh, hi, Caro. Oh, I haven't seen you for ages. How are you? Caro, your mic's not turned on. You've got to press... Does no one know how to video call? Uh, uh, Caro, you have to press the button that looks like a mic. It's at the bottom of the screen, Caro. Oh, she's giving out advice now. Oh, phew. I thought I was late, but at least Jen isn't here yet. I'm here. Jen, sort out your camera. Right. We need to talk about the summer show. We haven't got long left. There's no time to rehearse. Do we ever rehearse? Or why don't we just do a show that we've done before? <gasps> oh, why don't we do ever again? Oh, yes, oh, we do ever again. No. I wasn't in that show and I refuse to be an understudy. Why don't we just do another Jane Austen novel? They're basically the same, right? You don't get on the ten pound note for writing the same old thing. <laughs> yeah, otherwise Kieran would be on every note for writing the same old song every year. Right, Liam, me and you are gonna fall out. Focus! There's one that reminds me of Liam actually. Um, it's about arrogance and short sightedness. Uh, Pride and Prejudice. Yeah, that one. <laughs> yeah, okay, good idea. Everyone happy? Caro? Yeah. Oh, her mic is still off. Right, Emma. I mean, Hannah. You be Elizabeth because you basically are her. Moya, you can be Jane because she's nice and sweet like you. Uh, rude. I'm nice and sweet. Yeah, but let's be honest, you're not as nice and sweet as Moya, are you? You be Kitty and Meg can be Lydia. Meg! Well, she's far too old to be Lydia. Isn't she supposed to be 15 or 16? Meg, you look at least twice that. Shut up, Han! Han, I just think Meg and Caitlin are more suited to the, well, stupid characters. Oh, oh yeah, true. Uh, then there's just Mary. Um, if Steph's going to be Charlotte and Miss Bingley, she can't be Mary as well. You're too old. No, you're too old. Aidan, you're quite pretty. It'll have to be you. What? Be. Aiden, mate, you're the new kid. You don't get to argue. Yep, what he said. Sorry. Right, that's decided then. Off we go. Over to you. Once upon a time. In a not so distant corner of England lived an ordinary family by the name of Bennett. Kieran, what are you doing? Who's that? Well, you cast me as Nelly, the Yorkshire maid. I thought we agreed she was a non speaking part. Do you mean we agreed? Who's we? Well, me and all the others. Oh, charming. But you haven't cast a narrator, so someone's got to do it. All right, but if it doesn't work, we'll edit it out at the end, OK? We'll edit it out. Oh, so someone else has learned how to edit now, have they? You've really got ideas above your station these days, you know haven't what? you? I'm just going to... Much better. Anyway, where were we? Oh, yeah. Mr and Mrs Bennett, my employers, had five lovely daughters. And I loved each and every one of them dearly. But... This story follows Miss Elizabeth Bennet, known among her more intimate acquaintances as Lizzie. It is the truth, universally acknowledged, that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. <laughs> Isn't she charming? Oh, I can see the rest of her family now. Let's join them at their house at Longbourn, where Mrs. Bennet has some exciting news. Mr. Bennet! Mr. Bennet! Oh, oh, my dear Mr. Bennet, there you are at 
last. Have you heard? Netherfield Park is let. Mm. Oh, would you not want to know who has taken it? You want to tell me, and I have no objection to hearing it. Well, Mrs. Long says that Netherfield is taken by a young man of large fortune from the north of England. What is his name? Is he married or single? <laughs> single? Oh, Mr. Bennet, what a fine thing for our girls. <laughs> How so? How can you be so tiresome? I am thinking of his marrying one of them. You must go and visit him. <laughs> I see no occasion for that. You and the girls may go. I dare say Mr. Bingley will be very glad to see you. And I will send a few lines by you to throw in a good word for my little Lizzie. <laughs> Lizzie is not a bit better than the others, and she's not half so handsome as Jane, nor half so good-humoured as Lydia, but you are always giving her the preference. I should like to meet Mr Bingley. <laughs> <laughs> They're all silly and ignorant, just listen to them. Oh, that reminds me, Kitty, I have found the name of the captain who smiled at me at town last week. Captain Carter! <laughs> Let us go to Meryton this afternoon to try to see him, as he does go to London tomorrow. Yes, let's do that. I should like to meet Lieutenant Denny and Mr Wickham. Oh, Lydia, which bonnet should I wear? You must be two of the silliest girls in the country. I am astonished that you should be so ready to think your own children silly. Our two youngest daughters are uncommonly foolish. Well, you take delight in vexing me. You have no compassion on my poor nerves. You're mistaken, my dear. I have a high respect for your nerves. They are my old friends. I have heard you mention them every day for twenty years. You do not know what I suffer. Well, now please go and see Mr. Bingley, for it would be impossible for us to visit him if you do not. You are over scrupulous. What say you, Mary? You are a young lady of deep reflection? Uh, I wish to say something very sensible, but I know not how. Aidan? Mary is a young lady of the early 19th century. Yeah, and I'm a boy from the late 20th... Yes, but we don't have enough girls. Liam gets to be a boy. Look, I don't really want to do this, but if you still want to be Puck next year... <sighs> While Mary's adjusting her ideas, let us return to Mr Bingley. Oh, I am already sick of Mr Bingley. I'm sorry to hear that, but why did you not tell me so before? If I had known as much this morning, I would not have called upon him. It's very unlucky, but as I've actually paid the visit, we cannot escape the acquaintance now. Oh, is he handsome? Is he young? Oh, does he dance? Ask me no questions. You'll find out soon enough. <laughs> what an excellent father you have, girls. Lady Lucas and Charlotte Lucas, ma'am. Thank you, Nelly. Or I'll take tea with them. My dear Charlotte. Lizzie. Would you like some tea, love? There you go. Tea for you. There we go. How about you, madam? You're just a little for me. Thank you. I must confess, we have already taken tea. We have been to Netherfield. We called upon Mr Bingley. How did you find them? My father would tell us nothing. Oh, he is most agreeable. Very much the man of fashion. So genteel. And I think he took a liking to Charlotte. His sister is with him. Very fine young lady. She has come to keep house for him. I thought highly of Miss Bingley too. You will benefit from having her in the neighbourhood. They also have a friend visiting. And Mr Darcy. Ooh, another young man. Reported to have an income of £10,000 a year. £10,000? He is handsome, but with proud and disagreeable manners, of I thought. No matter if he is handsome and wealthy. <laughs> oh, well, uh, this has been most pleasant to do call again. <laughs> well, Charlotte Lucas. I cannot believe Mr Bingley took a liking to her. She's fully 27 and has never been handsome. Mama? Well, Jane, you'll be quite the old maid soon. You're almost three and twenty. Oh, Lord, how ashamed I should be of not being married before three and twenty. <laughs> oh, how I should like to be married before any of you. And then I shall chaperone you to all the balls. Such pleasures have no charm to me. I should infinitely prefer a walk. I see three people coming up the drive. Two handsome men and a woman. 
Oh no, not more visitors. I'll be in my room reading. Mr Bingley, Miss Bingley and Mr Darcy are here. Oh, 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 show them in. Good day to you all. May I present my sister, Miss Bingley, and my friend, Darcy. Oh, we are delighted to be acquainted with you all. Uh, my daughters, Jane, Elizabeth, uh, Kitty and Lydia. Mary, she's the clever one. She'll join us presently. Wait, how's that supposed to work? What am I doing? Ow! All right, ow! Hold still! Ow! Okay, something is better. Go. Oh, um, delighted to see you all, but, um... Please excuse me, I cannot be parted from my book. Um, there's such a cliffhanger at the end of chapter 13 of Robinson Crusoe. <laughs> I've come to make your acquaintance, and to invite you to a ball, which I shall be holding at Netherfield. A ball? A ball? Yay! She likes holding balls. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Bingley. We shall be honoured to attend. I do hope you'll invite some of the officers stationed at Meryton. <laughs> oh, we have such fun with them. If it pleases you, Miss Nett. And Mr Darcy, where are you from? Have you not heard of Mr Darcy? He owns Pembley in Derbyshire. He's been in my family for generations. Oh, how charming. Oh, Mr Bingley, you've met our dear friend Charlotte Lucas. Uh, yes, a very pleasant young lady. Oh, she is, but very plain. Shh, Mama. I thought her well, extremely beautiful. Well, it is in the eye of the beholder. I don't like to boast, but one rarely sees anyone better looking than my Jane. I agree entirely. Miss Bennet, I wondered if you would join us for dinner. Thank you, I would be most honoured. Well, in that case, so lightful as this has been, if you'll excuse us, we must take our leave of you all to prepare for dinner. Yes, let us go. Well, we shall look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. I'm glad to know you all. And I look forward to seeing you, Miss Bennet. Mama, may I take the carriage this evening? No, my dear. You'd better go on horseback, because it seems likely to rain, and, and then you'll be obliged to stay all night. Oh, I, uh... No, Lizzie, trust me, I know what I'm talking about. Lizzie, will you help me to dress? And I'll ask Nelly to prepare a horse. Of course. Oh, if I can see one of my daughters happily settled at Netherfield, and the others equally well married, I shall have nothing to wish for. <laughs> <laughs> And prepare that horse I did. Later that evening, our Jane set off on horseback to visit her new companions at their home in Netherfield. But, much to Mrs. Bennet's delight, a ferocious storm unleashed its rage on Jane. Storm. Put a storm on. Oh, for goodness. What do you mean, how do I make a storm? Just put some rain or something up. Fine, that'll do. This was a lucky idea of mine, indeed. <laughs> Didn't that look chilly? Oh, poor Jane. But, despite the rain's best efforts, our Jane arrived safely at Netherfield Park. Miss Elizabeth, I've got a letter for you. It is from Jane. My dearest Lizzie, I find myself very unwell this morning, which I suppose is because I got wet through yesterday. My kind friends will not hear of my returning home until I am better. Excellent. Well, my dear, if your daughter should have a dangerous fit of illness, 
Well, even I, it would be a comfort to know that it was all in pursuit of Mr. Bingley and under your orders. I shall go to her. But the horse is uh, lame. <laughs> oh, um, no animals were harmed in the making of this drama. Then I shall walk. How can you be so silly? In all this dirt? It is only three miles. I shall be back by dinner. We shall go as far as Meryton with you. Uh, besides, we may see something of the officers as well. Come, Lydia. Caitlin, what are you doing? Um, I'm in the next scene. Quick change. Oh, yeah. You could just cut. This isn't live. Oh, for goodness sake, just carry on. Our Lizzie set off on her big adventure, going under, over, through any obstacle she came across. And then, after hours of travelling, she reached her destination. Elizabeth Bennet, madam. Ah, uh, show her in, and take her horse round to the stables. Madam, she has walked. Good heavens, that's a near three mile walk. Walked? Are you quite sure? By the look of her stockings, ma'am, quite sure. for dropping by and announced. Please forgive me. Um, uh, I have come to inquire after my sister's health. Well, of course. Your sister slept quite ill, and although she is awake, she is still very feverish and unable to leave her room. The, the doctor came and, after examining his patient, supposed she had caught a violent cold. Is not that right, Darcy? I see. I must thank you for the hospitality and kindness you have shown towards my sister. In her letter to me, she expressed a great debt. Do not give it a moment's thought. Deirdre, will you please show Miss Bennet to her sister is staying? I am sure she will be thrilled to see. Of course, madam. Well, she had very little conversation. Wouldn't you say so, Darcy? I must admit, I didn't pay it much attention. Well, she has nothing in short to recommend her, except that she is an excellent walker! <laughs> oh, and her appearance, I'll never forget it, she was positively wild. This is lost on me, Louisa. I thought Miss Elizabeth Bennet looked perfectly well this morning. Oh, why must she be scampering about the country? Because her sister has a cold. Ugh. Her hair so untidy, her petticoat six inches deep in the mud. Her dirty petticoat quite escaped my notice. Well, I know. Darcy must have observed it. Hmm? I observed an affection for her sister, Miss Bingley, which was rather pleasing. I have an excessive regard for Jane Bennet, but with such a mother and father and such low connections, there is no chance of her being well settled. Yes, it must very materially lessen their chances of marrying a man of any consideration in the world. Quite right. Yet, it would not make them one jot less agreeable. Indeed. After spending some time with her sister, Elizabeth returned to the Bingleys to say her farewells. My sister feels quite buoyed by my visit and feels confident now in returning home. I have sent for our carriage, but my mother says the horses have been taken to Meryton to be re -shooed. So... <laughs> We shall walk. We must not have you scampering about the country. You must borrow our carriage. Oh, we should not want to impose. Not at all. Well, thank you. We would be most obliged. That must be a good book, Mr. Darcy. For I'm yet to see you lift your eyes from its pages. Mm. Are you well read, Miss Bennet? Uh, I should not say so, no. Although I, I do enjoy it. Oh, well, you should see the library that Mr. Darcy owns at Pemberley. It is quite remarkable. <laughs> oh, well, the size of one's library never really impressed me. Is that so? It is. I should hate to think of all those books being neglected and unread. 
neglected. Well, I should assure you, my library suffers from no such fate. I enjoy reading. It's a talent of mine. I can even read in the presence of stilted company. Ignore Darcy. Although, you show your clear ability to handle his mood yourself. The carriage is ready, sir. There's something on your mind. Oh, no, dear, no, no, not at all. Very well. Oh. Oh. Well, since you are so keen to talk about it, I am disappointed at their carelessness. Oh, Mama. Why, your elder sisters, of course. Of course. How could they be so reckless and cavalier in their actions? I do not doubt that Jane will have an illness far worse by the time she returns home. She should have stayed put a good deal longer. We'd rather her continue her imposition in Netherfield. Your mother is right that her early departure from Mr Bingley will affect her chances of marrying him. I hardly think she is an imposition at the home of her future beau. We are returned. Oh, Elizabeth, how could you be so careless? Your sister could have died on the way home. <laughs> Mama, I am perfectly fine. Do look a good deal perky than I thought. Perhaps you should return at once and thank your hosts. <laughs> I am pleased to see you back, girls. Jane, are you quite well? Ah, uh, yes, for pardon. Excellent. Now, my dear, I hope that you've ordered a good dinner today, because I have reason to expect an addition to our family party. Who do you mean, my dear? Well, the person whom I speak is a gentleman and a stranger. Oh, do you think it's him, Kitty? Is he coming to dine with us? Pray tell, who's got you both so excited, sisters? Mr. Mr. Wickham! A military man! Who called for us lately? And we expect for him to call again? At any moment. It is not, Mr. Wickham. Thank heavens! You have time to practice greeting from a ladylike manner! It is a person I've never seen before. My cousin, Miss Collins, who, when I am dead, may turn you all out of this house as soon as he pleases. Oh, my dear, pray do not talk of that odious man. I have received a letter from him, and he speaks of his concern for our daughters. Well, that is as may be, but I cannot bear to have him mentioned. But then I said, Patricia, you can't put the fish in a soup, because otherwise... I've come to call upon the Bennets. Oh, my God. You're so beautiful. <clears throat> Madam, right, sorry, follow me. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Wickham, madam. Oh, Mr. Wickham, on the other hand. Oh, oh right, Nelly T. Uh, Lydia, fix your hair. Elizabeth, go and greet him. Kitty, your petticoat. <laughs> I believe you've made the acquaintance of my family. Yes, I have had that pleasure. What except you? Miss Jane Bennett, I presume. Mr. Wickham, I have heard of you most favourably from my sisters. I hear you ladies are lately retired from Netherfield. How far is it from here? It is but three miles. Mr. Bingley was most accommodating to my sister when she was unwell on arriving there, and insisted she stayed several days to convalesce. Noble man. Am I right in believing that Mr. Darcy was present? Yes. He's been staying there about a month now. Although he is a man of very large property in Derbyshire. <laughs> no, I am aware of Mr. Darcy's estate. I have been connected with his family since infancy. You seem shocked by this, Miss Bennet. Are you well acquainted with Mr. Darcy? Oh, as much as I ever wished to be. I spent several long hours in his company at Netherfield. But I have no right to give my opinion, for it is impossible for me to remain impartial. On my word. His behaviour to myself has been scandalous and ungentlemanly. He has a thorough determined dislike of me, which I cannot but attribute in some measure to jealousy. Jealousy? How so? We are not on friendly terms. 
You see, his father, the late Mr. Darcy, was one of the best men that ever breathed, and the truest friend I ever had. And I cannot be in the company with this, Mr. Darcy, without being grieved to the soul by a thousand tender recollections. You see, the late Mr. Darcy left me a generous gift in his will, which the current Mr. Darcy chose not to honour after his father's passing. How strange! How abominable! I must say, I am shocked at his intimacy with Mr. Bingley, who seems good humour itself. Oh, he, he cannot know what Mr. Darcy is. Probably not, but Mr. Darcy can please where he chooses. A strange man is coming up the path. Oh, that will be Mr. Collins. <clears throat> Mr. William Collins is here. My dear Mr. Bennet, Mrs. Bennet, and these, these must be your charming daughters. <laughs> Oh, I have heard much of the beauty of these young ladies, but I see that in your case, my dear, your fame falls short of the truth. I do not doubt you will all in due time be well disposed of in marriage. You are very kind, sir, I am sure, and I wish with all my heart it may prove so, for else they will be destitute enough. You allude perhaps to the entail of this estate? I do indeed. I am very sensible, madam, of the hardship to my fair cousins, but I can assure the young ladies that I come prepared to admire them. Uh, this is my eldest daughter, Jane. I feel it incumbent upon me to hint that she is likely to be very soon engaged. My next daughter, Elizabeth, however... <laughs> Miss Elizabeth, may I say that you equal only your sister Jane in birth and in beauty? <laughs> well... I am most taken with Longbourn, Mr. Bennet. To my mind, it can only compare with Rosings Park, the home of my patroness, Lady Catherine de Burr. I am most honoured to be regularly invited to dine with her ladyship, and she has even graced me with her presence in my humble garden on one occasion. <laughs> Lady Catherine de Burr? You know she is Mr. Darcy's aunt. No, I did not. I've never heard of her before. Well... I think that tells us all we need to know about Mr. Collins. Well, dear friends, I shall take my leave of you and allow you to further your acquaintance with your cousin. Shall we see you at Mr. Bingley's ball, Mr. Wickham? Oh, how wonderful! May I have the honour of engaging you for the first three dances, Miss Elizabeth? Oh dear, stay tuned for more Pride and Prejudice. Oh, welcome back, my dears. How are you all getting on? You're just in time for Mr. Bingley's ball at Netherfield Park. The Bennet girls have been beside themselves with excitement all week at the very thought. The only dampener for Lizzie is the thought of having to dance with her cousin, Mr. Collins. Not once, not twice, but thrice. Oh, dear. My dear cousin, I've been waiting for this moment, the first of our dances together. You have, after all, promised me three this evening. Indeed, cousin, I have. Perhaps we may keep company for the entire evening. On the contrary, I think it best not to forget our manners and deprive our friends of our company for too long. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, Kitty, I have never seen so many handsome faces in all my life. And all in one room! The whole regiment appear to be here. Oh, what a night this will be! <laughs> oh, I shall not stop dancing until the carriages arrive to take us home and force us away! <laughs> Come, Darcy. I hate to see you standing about by yourself. You had much better dance. I certainly shall not. 
it would be a punishment for me to stand with any woman in this room. I have never seen so many pleasant and pretty girls in my life. My partner is the most beautiful creature. Do ask for a dance with her sister. Will not win with me, Bingley. Elizabeth is tolerable, but not handsome enough to tempt me. What a charming amusement for young people this is, Mr. Darcy. Your friend, Mr. Bingley, dances delightfully. And I doubt not that you're adept at it yourself. I never dance. Do you not think it would pay a proper compliment to the place? It is a compliment which I never pay if I can avoid it. <laughs> you have a house in town, I conclude. <laughs> My dear Miss Elizabeth, why are you not dancing? Mr. Darcy, you must allow me to present this young lady to you as a very desirable partner. Now, you cannot refuse to dance when so much beauty is before you. I have not the least intention of dancing. I entreat you not to suppose I moved this way in order to beg for a partner. Mr. Darcy is all politeness. But you excel so much in the dance, Miss Elizabeth, that it would be cruel to deny us the happiness of seeing you. So, Miss Elizabeth, I hear you're quite delighted with George Wickham. Hmm? I, um, I should tell you, his tale of Mr. Darcy using him ill is perfectly false. Mr. Darcy is not at all to blame. And Mr. Wickham's coming to this part of the country at all is the most insolent thing. I do pity you, Miss Eliza, for this discovery of your favourite skill. Miss Bingley, you are much mistaken if you expect to influence me. I see nothing in it but your own willful ignorance and the malice of Mr. Darcy. Oh, I beg your pardon! Do excuse my interference. It was kindly meant. They haven't got time for all this. Fast forward it a little bit. Go on. Oh, stop it there. I can guess the subject of your reverie. I should imagine not. You are considering how insupportable it would be to pass many evenings in this manner, in such society. And indeed, I am of your opinion. Oh, I was never more annoyed. The noise and seven points of all these people. The conjecture is totally wrong, I assure you. My mind was more agreeably engaged. I was meditating on the very great pleasure of a fine pair of eyes in the face of a very pretty young woman. Not Miss Elizabeth Bennet! Oh, I am all astonishment! Well, if you are serious about it, what a charming mother-in-law you shall have! And of course, she will always be with you at Pemberley. Elizabeth, my dear cousin, will you take my hand for another dance? Mr. Collins, I am flattered, but I should much rather stay here and watch. There are plenty of other agreeable young women here. Will you not stand up with any of them? I am perfectly indifferent to dancing. I shall be much happier remaining here with you for the whole evening. May I introduce you to my dear friend, Miss Charlotte Lucas? It's a pleasure, madam. I take it you are the cousin I've heard so much about. Would you care to join me in a dance? It would make me the happiest creature in the room! <laughs> A most excellent ball. Oh, Jane, you were so admired. Everybody says how well you looked. Mr. Bingley thought you quite beautiful. To think the two of you danced together twice. <laughs> I thought it bad taste to ask Miss Lucas to dance first. However, he did not admire her at all. Indeed, nobody can, you know. But I must say, Mr. Darcy is a most disagreeable, horrid man. I quite detest him. Just what a young man ought to be. A sensible, good humoured, and such happy manners. He is also handsome. You never see fault in anybody, Jane. 
I would not wish to think bad of anyone too hastily. It is that which makes you the wonder. I suppose you like this man's sister, too. I noticed her manners were not equal to his. Oh, Lizzie! Much to Lizzie's dismay, Mr. Collins had come to pay her a visit. May I hope, madam, for your interest with your fair daughter Elizabeth, when I solicit for the honour of a private audience with her. Oh, yes, certainly. I am sure Lizzie will be very happy. Uh, come, Jane, I want you upstairs. <laughs> Mama, do not go, I beg you. Mr. Collins can have nothing to say to me that anybody else need not hear. Nonsense, Lizzie. I insist upon your saying and hearing Mr. Collins. Believe me, my dear Miss Elizabeth, that your modesty so far from doing you any disservice rather adds to your other perfections. Now, have I ever mentioned to you my patroness, Lady Catherine de Bourgh? She recently recommended I should marry, and being as I am to inherit this estate after the death of your honoured father, who, however, may live many years longer, I could not satisfy myself without resolving to choose a wife from among his daughters. Almost as soon as I entered this house, I singled you out as the companion of my future life, and now nothing remains for me but to assure you in the most animated language of the violence of my affection. Marry me, Miss Elizabeth! Thank you, but no. Oh, you tease me. I shall lead you to the altar ere long. Really? No, I am perfectly serious in my refusal. I cannot make you happy, and I am convinced that I am the last woman in this world who could make you happy. Oh, you are uniformly charming. You are not serious in your rejection of me. <laughs> no, N no, 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 no. Oh, oh depend upon it, Mr. Collins. Lizzie shall be brought to reason. Ah, <laughs> uh, perhaps it would be better not to force her into accepting me. Uh, I shall be in the, uh, library. Lizzie, if you take it into your head to go on refusing every offer of marriage in this way, you will never get a husband at all. Uh, Mr. Bennet, you are wanted immediately. You must come and make Lizzie marry Mr. Collins. Tell her that you insist upon her marrying him, or I will never see her again. An unhappy alternative is before you, Elizabeth. In this day, you must be a stranger to one of your parents. Your mother will never see you again if you do not marry Mr. Collins, and I will never see you again if you do. <laughs> Charlotte Lucas, ma'am. Oh, Charlotte, oh, I am glad you have come. Maybe you can help. Mr. Collins has made an offer to Lizzie, and she will not have him. Maybe you can persuade her to comply with the wishes of all her family. No, poor oh, Mr. Collins. Uh, where did he go? Well, he's in the library. Oh, Mr. Wickham. Hello. Uh, yeah, just through there. You know where you're going. Oh, you. Come here. I need you to bleach me tash and curl me hair. The handsome man's back again. Uh, do forgive me for my absence at Neverfield yesterday. My friends informed me that it was a most delightful ball. Indeed it was. Well, my sisters and I had hoped for your presence. I trust it wasn't a serious cause that kept you away. On the contrary. It was self-imposed. I thought I had better not meet Mr. Darcy. To be in the same room as him might have been more than I could bear. I had supposed as much. <laughs> Engaged to Mr. Collins. Oh, my dear Charlotte. It's impossible. I know what you're feeling. You must be surprised. But when you've had time to think it all over, I hope you will be satisfied. I am not romantic. I only ask a comfortable home. I'm convinced that my chance for happiness with Mr. Collins is fair. Undoubtedly. We are very proud. But Mr. Collins wants to marry Lizzie! Shh, Mama. I think we had better take our leave. That is probably for the best. Oh, and I congratulate you, my dear friend. 
Goodbye. Poor Charlotte. Uh, I used to think Charlotte Lucas tolerably sensible. Now I see she's even more foolish than you, my dear. Oh, Mr. Bennet, it is very hard to think that Charlotte Lucas should ever be mistress of this house, that I should be forced to make way for her and live to see her take my place in it. Let us not give way to gloomy thoughts. Let us flatter ourselves that I may be the survivor. <laughs> and to think that Lady Lucas will have a daughter married before I have. Well, that was a lucky escape. <laughs> Indeed. I have been meaning to say to you, Lizzie, that I have observed Mr. Darcy whenever we are in his company. He is clearly partial to you. Oh, nonsense! Although, I do seem to meet Mr. Darcy unexpectedly whenever I'm out walking lately, and he usually deems it necessary to turn back and walk with me. <laughs> even if he never says a great deal. <laughs> they are gone! The militia, the officers! They have left Meryton. Oh, I cannot eat, drink, or sleep. My misery is so extreme! Good heaven! What is to become of us? What are we to do? I am sure I cried for two days when I was a girl and Colonel Miller's regiment went away. I thought I should have broke my heart. Oh, I am sure I shall break mine. Oh, how can you smile, Lizzie? I didn't smile. Would I smile? They are going to be encamped near Brighton. I do so want Papa to take us all there for the summer. Oh, what a delightful idea. Oh, if only we could go to Brighton. Well, please, a little sea bathing would set me up forever. It would do me a great deal of good. Well, please, please take us to Brighton, to Brighton for the summer. summer. Oh, please. Please. I am going to take a turn. I wish you luck, Papa. <laughs> Mr. Darcy. Miss Bennet, I have come to inquire after your help. Well, uh, thank you. I am quite well. And yourself, Mr. Darcy? Yes, I'm quite well, thank you. I hear your cousin, Mr. Collins, is to marry your friend. Yes. Well, he is very fortunate in his choice of wife. Yes, indeed. Although I'm not sure I consider her marrying Mr. Collins the wisest thing she ever did. She seems perfectly happy, however. Miss Bennet, in vain I've struggled. It will not do. My feelings... My feelings will not be repressed. You must allow me to tell you how ardently I admire her and love you. Mr. Darcy, I cannot... I have never desired your good opinion. I'm sorry to have occasioned you pain. And this is all the reply that I am to have the honour of expecting, is it? I may perhaps wish to be informed as to why, with such a little attempt at civility, I am thus rejected. I have every reason in the world to think ill of you. From the first moment of my acquaintance with you, all I saw in you was arrogance, conceit, and then selfish disdain of the feelings of others. And I had not known you a month before I knew you were the last man in the world whom I could ever be prevailed on to marry. It was not merely this affair which my dislike is founded on. Your character was unfolded to me by Mr. Wickham. On this subject, what can you have to say? You do not know what that man is capable of. Last year, having squandered the money left to him by my father in his will that was supposed to pay for his training as a clergyman. Last year he attended to elope with my 15-year-old sister whose fortunes amount to £30,000 a year. Fortunately, a day or two before the intended elope and my sister acknowledged the whole to me. And until his appearance recently in the county, I have not seen Mr Wickham since. That is the faithful narrative, madam. This is false. This cannot be. This is the grossest falsehood. You have said quite enough, madam. 
I perfectly comprehend your feelings and am now ashamed of what mine could have been. Accept my sincere apologies for having taken up so much of your time and accept my best wishes for your health and happiness. Jane, do you think there is any truth in what Mr. Wickham said about Mr. Darcy? I perfectly remember everything he said to me when he first met me, and now I wonder at his impropriety in saying such things to a stranger. Mr. Bingley does assert Darcy's blamelessness in the whole affair. Oh, dear. I think I may have acted despicably towards Mr. Darcy. Had I been in love, I could not have been more wretchedly blind, but... Vanity, not love, has been my folly. What a strange thing to say, my dear Lizzie, about being in love. Jane, I... Wickham will soon be gone, and therefore it will not signify to anybody here what he really is. I have received an invitation from Mrs. Forster, the wife of the Colonel of the Regiment, to accompany her to Brighton. Brighton? Oh, I am in ecstasy! I have visited Brighton compromises every possibility of earthly happiness. Oh, I will be the object of attraction to all. <sighs> I am mortified. I cannot see why Mrs. Forster should not ask me as well as Lydia. For although I am not her particular friend, I am two years older. Papa, I do not think you should let her go. She is the most determined flirt. Vain, ignorant, without any attraction beyond youth and the... Tolerable person. It is true that Lydia will never be easy till she has exposed herself in some public place or other. But we shall have no peace at Longbourn if she does not go to Brighton. Colonel Forster is a sensible man and will keep her out of any real mischief. After some careful deliberation, Mr. Bennet agreed to let Lydia go off on her big adventure as she said goodbye to her family. I too have had an invitation. Charlotte Lucas, the new Mrs. Collins, is insistent that I pay them a visit in their new home in Derbyshire. Derbyshire? Oh, it is impossible for me to hear that word without thinking of Pemberley and its owner, Mr. Darcy. Oh, but surely it is highly unlikely that I shall see him. But in any case, I feel I should accept the invitation for poor Charlotte's sake. Absence has increased my desire to see her and weakened my disgust of Mr. Collins. My dear Lizzie, it gives me great pleasure to see you. We are exceedingly grateful to have the favour of your company, Miss Bennet. We shall do everything in our power to prevent you spending your time unpleasantly. That is most kind. We shall begin by taking you to see a place of which you have heard much, Pemberley. Oh, I, uh... Charlotte, I really am rather tired. Pray, no protestations. It is not merely a fine house, richly furnished, but they have some of the finest woods in the county. Come along to Pemberley! I cannot contemplate how dreadful it would be if we were to encounter Mr. Darcy whilst viewing this place. Of which I might have been mistress. at home. No, but we expect him tomorrow with a party of friends. I can only rejoice we did not delay our visit. We await his return with eagerness. He is the best landlord and the best master. You are very lucky. I say no more than the truth and what everybody will say that knows him. I have never had a cross word with him in all my life and I have known him ever since he was four years old. Some people call him proud, but I am sure I never saw anything of it. Can this be the same Mr. Darcy? And are you acquainted with Mr. Wickham? Oh, ah, yes, I knew him very well. Very attractive man. He is now gone into the army, but I am afraid he has turned very wild. Well, what a surprise! Here is the master now, returned a day earlier than expected. Kira, will you stop making all that noise, please? Mum, it's so embarrassing. Oh, good Lord. 
This is the most awkward, most ill-judged, most unfortunate thing in the world. I must say I'm rather taken aback by his beauty. No, Elizabeth, he, he is full of arrogance and short-sightedness and... Oh, but he is so manly. No, Elizabeth! No. Mr. Darcy! Miss Bennett! What a delightful place! Charming! I, uh... Thank you. Uh, are you well? Yes, thank, thank you. Yes, thank you. And, and yourself? Oh, yes, uh, quite well, thank you. And you? No, it's on you. I asked you. Sorry, just been for a swim in the lake. Oh, um... Thank you. Your, your housekeeper informed us that you would not be here till tomorrow. Yes, well, uh, I was rather impatient to uh, return. Uh, the Bingleys are here too. May I inquire after your family's health? It is a very long time since I've had the pleasure of seeing your charming sister. We have not met since the 26th of November. Pray, Miss Eliza, are not the militia removed from Mansion? They must be a great loss to your family. Come, Miss Bennet. We must take our leave. My patroness, the Lady Catherine de Burr, expects me. Good day to you all. <laughs> How very ill Miss Elizabeth Bennet looked. I never in my life saw anyone so much altered as she is since the winter. She's grown so brown and coarse. I observed no other alteration other than the fact that she was tanned, which is hardly a miraculous consequence of it being summer. I must confess, I never could see any beauty in her. I remember when we first knew her in Hertfordshire, how amazed we were to find that she was a reputed beauty. I particularly recollect your saying one night, she a beauty, I should as soon call her mother a wit. <laughs> yes. That was before I knew her. See us next time in Pride and Prejudice. Miss Elizabeth, a letter. Whoa, hang on a second. I didn't know you had a cameo in this, Jen. Shut up. We're desperate, all right? Can you not pause on this, please? I don't want people to see how much weight I've put on in lockdown. Oh, rubbish. I think you look great in that mob cap. Thank you. What is from Jane? My dearest Lizzie, something has occurred of a most unexpected and serious nature. What I have to say relates to poor Lydia. An express came late last night from Colonel Forster to inform us that she was gone off to Scotland with one of his officers. To own the truth, with Mr. Wickham. Imagine our surprise. To Kitty, however, it does not seem so wholly unexpected. I am very, very sorry. So imprudent a match on both sides. Then Colonel Forster came to the house yesterday to tell us that, although Lydia's short letter to Mrs. Forster gave them to understand that they were going to Gretna Green, something was dropped off by another officer expressing his belief that Wickham never intended to go there or to marry Lydia at all. Colonel Forster has gone after them to try and find them. Our distress, my dear Lizzie, is very great. Our father and mother believe the worst. Our poor mother is sadly grieved and keeps to her room. And I never saw our father so affected. Shall I own that I long for your return? Yours affectionately. Your sister, Jane. Lydia, what have you done? I must go. I must go home. Mr. Darcy. Oh, uh, um, I beg your pardon. I'm about to leave. I have business that cannot be delayed. I, I have not a moment to lose. What's the matter? I, I will not detain you, but please let me help you. Thank you. 
there is nothing the matter with me. I am quite well. I am only distressed by some dreadful news which I have just received from Longbourn. Mr. Darcy, I fear I was most unfair to you back in Hertfordshire. I did not believe what you had to say about Mr. Wickham. Now I... Please, I am indeed shocked. Shocked and grieved, but before Lydia removed to Brighton, did you have any reason to believe them fond of each other? Well, not really. I can remember no symptom of affection on either side. When he first entered the court, she was ready enough to admire him, but well, so we all were. Lizzie was very young, and she's not been taught to think on serious subjects. I'm afraid she's been allowed to dispose of her time in the most idle and frivolous manner. I should warn you, Wickham will never marry a woman without money. She's been through it, isn't she? Mr. Collins kindly lent her one of his carriages, and she went back home to Longbourn to be with her family. Lizzie, thank goodness you have returned. My dear Jane, what is the news? Our papa has gone to town to try and find Lydia and Wickham, and has written merely to say that he will not write again until he has something of importance to mention. And how is Mama? She is upstairs. And how are you? You look pale. Oh, how much you must have gone through. I am perfectly well, thank you. Oh, my dear Mary! Lizzie! Do not worry, sister. This is a most unfortunate affair, and will probably be much talked of. But we must stem the tide of malice, and pour into the wounded bosoms of each other the balm of sisterly consolation. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mary. Kitty, how are you? Well, I can now go to Meryton without tears. Now go to Mama upstairs. <laughs> Mama! Oh, oh, my dear Lizzie. Oh, how I am grieved. Oh, if I'd been able to carry my point of going to Brighton with all the family, this would not have happened. But poor dear Lydia had nobody to take care of her. Oh, why did the forces ever let her out of their sight? I am sure there was some great neglect on their side, for she is not the kind of girl to do such a thing. Oh, I always thought they were very unfit to have the charge of her, but I was overruled, as I always am. Oh. Dear child, and now he's Mr. Bennet gone away, and I know he will fight with him when he meets him, and then he will be killed, and the Covington will turn us out before he's caught in his queen. Oh, what's to become of us all? Mr. Bennet is returned. Oh, 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 what news? Oh. I've seen them both. They're not yet married, and I've seen no intention to do so, but I have negotiated with Wickham. And agreed an annual allowance for Lydia, and they will be married. I dislike it very much, but it had to be done. Oh, and I'm sending them to live in the north as a punishment. Dear father, well done. Oh, my dear, dear Lydia. Oh, oh, oh this is delightful indeed. She will be married. <laughs> I shall see her again. She will be married at sixteen. Oh, how I long to see her, and to see dear Wickham too. Oh, my dear, dear Lydia, how merry we shall be together when we meet. In a short time, I shall have a daughter married. Oh, Mrs. Wickham, oh, how well it sounds. I will go to Meryton. Oh, as soon as I'm dressed, and tell everyone the wonderful news. Oh, how strange this is! For this we are to be thankful! That they should be married, wretched as is his character, we are forced to rejoice! We must endeavour to forget all that has passed. 
I hope and trust that they will yet be happy. So you know, Papa, I am not going to run away. If I should ever go to Brighton, I would behave much better than Lydia. <laughs> you go to Brighton? I would not trust you to go anywhere near it. No, Kitty, I have learned to be cautious and will feel the effects of it. If the officer is ever to enter my house again, halls will be absolutely prohibited. And you will never stir out of doors. Did you not make yourself unhappy? If you've been a good girl for the next ten years, we will review the situation. <laughs> Lizzie, let me say to you that you were justified in your advice to me last May, which, considering the event, shows some greatness of mind. <laughs> and there is something more I must tell you, which is for your ears only. Upon my arrival in London, neither Colonel Forster nor I could find news of Lydia and Wickham. And there we had a most unexpected visitor, Mr. Darcy. Darcy? He had also come to town with the resolution of finding Lydia and Wickham. The motive, for first, was his conviction of its being owing to himself that Wickham's worthlessness had not been so well known. <clears throat> it more than we had to direct his search, and after a few days he was able to discover them. When he spoke of Wickham alone, he discovered that Wickham had, in actual fact, been obliged to leave the regiment on account of some very pressing debts, and had no intention of marrying Lydia. He actually told Darcy that he still cherished the hope of more effectually making his fortune by marriage. And as I'm not meant to be a wealthy man, Lydia did not therefore fit the bill. Suffice to say, my dear Lizzie, Wickham's debts are mounting, I believe to considerably more than a thousand pounds, have been settled by Mr. Darcy. And as a consequence, Wickham has married your sister. Mr. Darcy saved me a world of trouble and economy. Mr. Darcy did all that for a girl whom he can neither regard nor esteem. I can only wonder whether he did it for me. A carriage from London, madam. Oh, 
It was with a great sadness to have missed the occasion. Well, we shall, however, celebrate your few days' stay with us here while we can. Oh, we will rejoice in parties and plentiful visits to town. May I walk with you, dear sister? For now you are my sister. I, uh... We were always good friends. Now we are better. I hear from our father that you have seen Pemberley. I have. And you saw the old housekeeper, I suppose. She was always very fond of me. But of course, she did not mention my name to you. Yes, she did. And? What did she say? That you had gone into the army and she was afraid it had not turned out well. I was surprised to see Darcy in town last month. We passed each other several times. I wonder what he can be doing there. Must be something particular to take him there at this time of year. Undoubtedly. Well, I... Well, it is time for us to leave, and for me to take up my commission in Newcastle. Oh, my dear Lydia, when shall we meet again? Oh, Lord! I don't know. Not these two or three years, perhaps. Oh, write to me very often, my dear. As often as I can. But you know married women don't have time to write. My sisters may write to me. They will have nothing left to do. <laughs> oh, goodbye. 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 Oh, Mr Wickham. You're not going so soon, are you? Mm. Take me with you. Please. Absolutely not. Oh, but you're the most beautiful Darling. man I've ever seen in my life. Darling, please hurry up. Mr. Wickham. Ah, he is as fine a fellow as I ever saw. I'm prodigiously proud of him, and I defy even Lady Lucas herself to produce a more valuable son-in-law. <gasps> Mama, I see Mr. Bingley coming up the drive. Mr. Bingley! Well, it is a long time since we have seen him. I'm going upstairs to read your book. Mr Bingley, madam. It is a long time, Mr Bingley, since you went away. A great many changes have happened in the neighbourhood. Miss Lucas is married and settled, and one of my own daughters. I suppose you have heard of it. It is a delightful thing to have a daughter well married. Uh, but at the same time, Mr Bingley, it is very hard to have her taken such away from me. They are gone to Newcastle, a place quite northward, it seems. What is the matter, Mamma? Why do you keep winking at me? Nothing, child, nothing. I did not wink at you. Come here, my love. I want to speak to you. Uh, and Lizzie. Uh, Kitty and I are going upstairs to sit in my dressing room. <laughs> I am so happy. I do not deserve it. I must go instantly to our mother. He has gone to Papa already. Oh, Lizzie, to know that what I have to relate will give such pleasure to our dear family. How shall I bear so much happiness? Oh, I am the most fortunate creature that ever existed. May I claim the good wishes and affection of a sister? I am delighted at the prospect. Where is your sister? Oh, she was with my mother upstairs. Oh, my dear, dear Jane, I am so happy. I'm sure I shall get a wink of sleep all night. I was sure you could not be so beautiful for nothing. Oh, he is the handsomest man that ever was seen. <laughs> Jane, I congratulate you. You'll be a very happy woman. The family's celebrations were quickly cut short by the arrival of the elusive Lady Catherine de Burger. What? Burger. What? Oh, de Burger. Come, my dear, let us go for a walk in the shrubbery. I hope you are well, Miss Bennet. That lady, I suppose, is your mother. She is? Yes, madam. And that, I suppose, is one of your sisters? Yes.
yes, madam, she is my youngest girl but one. My youngest of all is lately married, and my eldest is somewhere about the grounds walking with a young man who will soon become a part of the family. You have a very small park here. It is nothing in comparison with Rosings, my lady, I dare say, but I assure you it is much larger than Lady Lucas's. Miss Bennet, there seems to be a prettyish kind of lawn. I shall be glad to take a turn in it if you will favour me with your company. Go, my dear. I think her ladyship will be pleased with all our different walks. You can be at no loss, Miss Bennet, to understand the reason of my journey hither. Your own heart, your own conscience must tell you why I come. Indeed, you are mistaken, madam. Miss Bennet, you ought to know that I am not to be trifled with. A report of a most alarming nature has reached me. I was told that not only your sister was on the point of being most advantageously married, but that you, Miss Elizabeth Bennet, would in all likelihood be soon united with my nephew, my own nephew Darcy. I know it must be a scandalous falsehood. I would not injure him so much as to suppose the truth of it possible. If you believe it to be so, I wonder you took the trouble of coming so far. Do you pretend, then, to be ignorant of such a report? Do you not know that such a report is spread abroad? I never heard that it was. Has my nephew made you an offer of marriage? Your ladyship has declared it to be impossible. <laughs> Miss Bennet, do you know who I am? I cannot believe the upstart pretensions of a young woman without family, connection or fortune. If you were sensible of your own good, you would not wish to quit the sphere in which you have been brought up. In marrying your nephew, I would not consider myself quitting that sphere. He is a gentleman. I am a gentleman's daughter. So far, we are equal. You give your opinion very decidedly for so young a person. Tell me, once and for all, are you engaged to him? No. I'm not. Good. And you'll promise me never to enter into such an engagement? I will make no promise of the kind. Miss Bennet, I'm shocked and astonished. I expect to find a more reasonable young woman. I shall not go away until you have given me the assurance I require. Well, I certainly shall never give it. I will not be intimidated into anything so wholly unreasonable. I beg to be importuned no further on the subject. Not so hasty, please. I am no stranger to the particulars of your youngest sister's elopement, I know it all. And is such a girl to be my nephew's sister? Are the shades of Pemberley to be thus polluted? You would ruin him in the opinion of all his friends and make him the contempt of all the world. You can have nothing further to say. You have insulted me in every possible method. I am now returning to the house. Well, I take no leave of you, Miss Bennet. I send no compliments to your mother. You deserve no such attention. I am most seriously displeased. Lizzie, where is Lady Catherine? She left. Oh, well, what a, what a very fine-looking woman she is. And her calling here was prodigiously civil. I suppose she had nothing particular to say to you, Lizzie? Ah, I... Ah, Lizzie. I was just going to look for you. Come into the library. <sighs> I received a letter this morning that has astonished me exceedingly. As it principally concerns yourself, so you want to know its contents. I did not know that I had two daughters on the brink of matrimony. Let me congratulate you on a very important conquest. You look conscious, but I think you may defy even your sagacity to discover the name of your admirer. This letter is from Mr. Collins. Mr. Collins? Oh, what can he have to say? Well, he talks of Jane's engagement, but then he says he has heard that you also will not long bear the name of Bennet. Can you possibly guess, Lizzie, what is meant by this? This young gentleman is blessed in a peculiar way with everything the heart of mortal can most desire. Splendid property, noble kindred, and extensive patronage. Yet, in spite of all these temptations, let me warn my cousin Elizabeth and yourself of what evils you may incur. My motive for cautioning you is as follows. We have reason to believe that his aunt, Lady Catherine de Bourgh, does not look on the match with a friendly eye. Mr. Darcy, you see, is the man. Oh, I'm... I'm excessively diverted, but it 
is it so strange? Yes, that's what makes it so amusing. Had they fixed on any other man, it would have been nothing. But Darcy's perfect indifference and your perfect dislike make it so delightfully absurd. And pray, Lizzie, what said Lady Catherine about this report? Did she call to refuse her consent? <laughs> Mama, Mr Bingley's here again, and there is a gentleman with him. Oh, well, who can it be? It looks just like that man that used to be with him before. Mr. What's his name? The proud one. Oh, good gracious, Mr. Darcy. Well, any friend of Mr. Bingley's will always be welcome here, to be sure, but else I must say, I hate the very sight of him. Mr. Darcy, I wonder if I may prevail upon you to take a walk with me around the grounds. Mr. Darcy, I am a very selfish creature, and I have grossly misjudged you. I must thank you for the unexampled kindness you have shown towards my poor sister. Ever since I've known it, I have been most anxious to acknowledge to you how gratefully I feel it. I am exceedingly sorry that you may have been informed of something that may have caused you uneasiness. On the contrary. Let me thank you again and again in the name of all my family. If you are to thank me, let it be from yourself alone. Much as I admire your family, I only thought of you. Miss Bennet, you are too generous to trifle with me. If your feelings are what they were of last April, tell me so at once. My feelings and wishes are unchanged, but a word from you will silence me on the subject forever. Mr Darcy. My sentiments have undergone so material a change that I accept your present assurances with gratitude and pleasure. Then, may I ask you, again, for your hand in marriage? Yes. And I willingly accept. I must thank my aunt. The delightful Lady Catherine. She came to see me after she visited you and disclosed the substance of your conversation. Her unjustifiable endeavours to keep us apart, unluckily for her, but luckily for us, had the opposite effect. I knew then that had you been so absolutely decided against me, you would have disclosed it frankly and openly to her. Yes, you know enough of my frankness to believe me capable of that. After I've abused you so openly to your face, I can have no scruple in abusing you to your relations. What did you say that I did not assert? My behaviour was unpardonable and I cannot think of it without abhorrence. You have taught me a lesson. I am humbled by you. Huh. You admired my impertinence. For the livelihoods of your mind, now come. Will you have me write and break the news to my delightful aunt? You are joking, Lizzie. This cannot be. Engaged to Mr. Darcy. It cannot be. I know how much you dislike him. That is all to be forgot. This is the last time I shall ever remember it myself. My dearest sister, now do be serious. I want you to talk very seriously. Will you tell me how long you have loved him? I believe it must date from when I saw him at Pemberley. Now I am quite happy, for you will be as happy as myself. <laughs> Although the rest of her family were overjoyed by the news, Mr. Bennet called Lizzie to the library because he was slightly more confused. Oh my god. Oh my gosh, I'm a poet. Write that down before I forget it. Lizzie, what are you doing? Have you not always hated this man? I did once, but my opinion is completely altered. Will he make you happy? I believe he will. Do you have any other objection than your belief of my indifference? Not at all. We all know him to be a proud, unpleasant sort of man, but he did pay Wickham's debts, so we will overlook his unpleasantness if you really like him. I do. I do like him. I love him. That is a relief, because I have given him my consent. He is the kind of man to whom I should never dare refuse anything. Now go and break the news to your mother. And if any young men come by for Mary or Kitty, send them in. Oh, good gracious, Lord bless me, only think. Dear me, Mr. Darcy, well, who would have thought it? Oh, my sweetest Lizzie, oh, how rich and how great you'll be. Uh, pray, apologise.
apologise for my having disliked him so much before. I hope he will overlook it. Oh, everything is charming. Three daughters married. Ten thousand a year. Oh, what will become of me? I shall go distracted. And so we were married. Myself and Mr Bingley, Elizabeth and Mr Darcy. Oh, I am filled with delighted pride. Sadly, the effect is not enough to make my wife a sensible, amiable, well-informed woman. She's still invariably silly. I miss Elizabeth this evening, but I delight in my regular visits to Pemberley. And why all three of my sons in laws highly, although Wickham perhaps is my favourite. As my father still will not consent to me attending any of the balls Lydia invites me to, I spend much of my time with Jane and Elizabeth. This has made me less irritable, less ignorant, and less insipid. I'm much nicer than Lydia. I remain at home, and am often drawn from pursuing my accomplishments by my mother, who is unable to sit alone. Like my mother, I am still ridiculous. <laughs> I am utterly mortified by Darcy's marriage. I too am extremely indignant about my nephew's marriage. In spite of that, I have recently condescended to wait on Darcy and that insolent girl at Pemberley. And Mr. and Mrs. Bingley and Mr. and Mrs. Darcy lived happily ever after. As for me, now uh, the uh, main character, protagonist, if you will, well, once all the girls had flown the nest, Nellie earned enough money to become an independent woman. She took to writing and became, well, rather successful. <laughs> But she did so under a pseudonym because nobody could take the name Nelly seriously. What was that? What was the pseudonym? <laughs> My dear. Haven't you worked that one out yet? It was Austin. Jane Austin. <laughs> <laughs> Jenny? Oi, Jen. Jen, have you fallen asleep? No, that was rubbish. Let's just do Emma again. You know what? Get that fire exit. Shut up. Oh, go, go away. So rude, just so rude. <sighs>
Thank you so much for tuning in and watching our little bit of lockdown frivolity. We hope you've enjoyed it. It's been a labour of love and certainly a huge learning curve as well because none of us had ever done anything like this before the pandemic. Each of the actors set up and filmed themselves in their own homes. And then Kieran has spent literally months, I don't know, seven or eight, day in, day out, teaching himself how to edit and then putting it into practice and putting all this together, which is just amazing. Uh, now, I'm sure you're all aware that our industry has been quite hard hit by the pandemic and everybody involved in this project gave their time completely free of charge. Um, so I'd like to thank them all very much myself. In this time period, we would normally have produced at least two uh, tours and sold thousands of tickets, but obviously we've not been able to. So if you could consider in your hearts to make a small donation to go towards the actors, we would be hugely grateful. And you can do that by going to the address here on screen. Thank you so much. Stay safe. And we can't wait to bring you some real live theatre uh, soon, later this year in 2021. Please keep an eye on our socials and at our website, uh, www.jennyrenproductions.co.uk for further details. Thank you so much. Bye bye.